many of you know that in addition to preaching in warehouses where birds fly, don't look up. He's in here somewhere. I'm also a trained hospital chaplain. And during my time at uh, Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center, I had the opportunity, the duty, to sit with several patients who were in the last moments of their lives. Uh, often these individuals were older, sometimes they were young, sometimes the deaths were quite expected, and sometimes unexpected. Sometimes it was just me and the patient, but more often than not, it was the patient, the family, and friends who had gathered to exchange final words. Now once in a while you might hear something unexpected like, hey, what does this button do? Or, you know, uh, I was always daddy's favorite. That was always a winner. But upon reflection, there are 11 words that I heard the most. I'll miss you. Thank you. I forgive you. And I love you. It was those last three, I love you, that would hang there as breaths were taken for the last time. Though I must admit, I often got the impression that it had been a long time since those words had been exchanged between many of the parties that I bore witness to. In many ways, I love you are life's three hardest words. Three simple words that are most difficult to get right. I love you. What makes the words that everyone most wants to hear so hard to get right? What can be said of a culture where what we prize, what we value and hunger for the most, authentic, loving relationships, prove the most elusive to find? I love you. Three simple words. Leonard Sweet, a professor at the seminary I attended, contends that a, a proper understanding of each of these words is essential to living a biblical lifestyle. But that we struggle to do so because each of the words, I love you, has been corrupted by our culture. A culture that offers us a death style while calling it and selling it as a lifestyle. You know as well as I do that there are many who go through their lives living on the planet a bit like the dinosaurs used to live in. A dinosaurian philosophy of life is a basic brain response to everyday existence. Feed on this, fight about that, protect yourself, pleasure yourself as often as possible. Feeding, fighting, fleeing, and sex. It's not that they don't have a life. We would be wrong to tell them, hey, get a life. They have one. It's that they don't have a true life, an abundant life as Jesus defined both abundance and life. Dr. Sweet says, in contrast, a lifestyle that is rooted in the divine human relationship hinges on these three words, I love you, and on the new identity, new integrity, and new intimacy that broke into history with the coming of the greatest lover the world has ever known. Jesus Christ. The love Jesus taught and the love he gave provides us with a new model for living, a new way to be human, a new identity of I, a new integrity of love, and a new intimacy of you. Jesus came in part to make sure that we could correctly answer two of the very first questions that God ever asked. First, where are you? The question directed to Adam and Eve is the most universal question of existence. Where in the world are you? Where are you in the world? It's the identity question. The second question, where is your brother? Our sin and shame echo a response. Am I my brother's keeper? This question, which as Cain realized, is really two questions wrapped in one, is the integrity and the intimacy question. Am I responsible for someone else? Am I to have a relationship with that person? 
Wherein lies the power to truly love one another? In God and in his love story. Like Cain, we will never get I love you right unless we first get the story of love right. Without the right love story, we have no hope of living in the authentic identity, integrity, and intimacy of I love you. The Christian story is the story of a loving God who loved and loved the world so much that he is doing everything he can to pursue a relationship with all that he made. The story of Jesus is not primarily one in which we are given a new philosophy or a new belief system, a new package of doctrine. Rather, the story of Jesus is one in which he offered the world a new heart for God, a new heart for ourselves, a new heart for truth, a new heart for life, and a new heart for others. Think about the icon of Christianity. Our icon is not a thinker sitting down, thinking. The icon of Christianity is a savior nailed to the cross with the world in his hands. I love you. In these three words is the essence of God. In these three words is the essence of a biblical, true, and abundant lifestyle. Lord God, you are simply love. We ask that you would come and be with us this morning. That we may too learn how to love like you. Amen. Amen. I love you. <laughs> These three small words are the hardest in the English language to get right. We live in a culture where the I has become a God, where love is far from being another name for Christ, and where people choke on the word you if they can even manage to say it at all. I want to take a few minutes this morning and look at each of these words apart, and then we'll put them back together. We'll start with I. Oh, the power and the pride of I. <laughs> Always capitalized, right? Standing tall like the Tower of Babel. A steel dagger staring into the sky and saying, hey, look at me. Look what I can do all by myself. I. Our world doesn't lack for inflated egos. It was said that the late actor Marlon Brando's favorite words were Marlon and Brando. Tonight Show pioneer Jack Parr once commented on humorous Steve Allen, I'm very fond of him, but not as much as he is. The late Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein selected Frank Sinatra's version of My Way as the theme song for his 54th birthday. Indeed, our culture is more addicted to the Sinatra doctrine, I did it my way, than to, let's say, the Garth Brooks doctrine, people loving people. A much shared story involves two authors who were talking at a party. One went on and on about the great reviews his most recent book had received. Then checking himself, he said to the other author, well, enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think about my book? <laughs> Despite these ego trips and for all its potential for abuse, misuse, and God-denying self-obsession, we still can't si simply obliterate the eye as if it were just not that important. Because it is important. The I is essential. Without a proper understanding of who we are as individuals, we will never be capable of true love and of loving others like Jesus. So who are we? First and foremost, Genesis tells us that we are children of God created in His image to be in relationship with Him and His creation. We aren't God's, but we aren't junk either. When we accept Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us that in Christ we are a new creation. That old dinosaur is gone and a new being is here. Standing against current cultural norms, authentic Christianity is more self-sacrifice than self-fulfillment. Christianity holds out the truth that an ego trip is a journey to nowhere. When we try to live solely by the standards of the American dream, we are in fact living a lie. It's not a love story. It's a flawed and selfish story. Whose measure of success will we adopt? It's not to say that as Christians we don't have our issues. We have issues. But they're not the issues that readily come to the mind of many. 
Our issue is not, what do I want, but what is wanted of me. Our issue is not, how can you meet my needs, but rather, how am I meeting the world's needs? Our issue is not, am I on top, but am I on tap? Am I available for God to use? Our issue is not, how can I chart my own path, but how can I find and follow God's path that he's chosen for me? Our issue is not, see how special I am, but how great is our God. Our identity as an I needs to be shaped in relationship to those around us by living in Christ. Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The self can only be named and shaped in relation to God. We are saved from ourselves so that we can look to and rely on Christ. Rather than looking in the mirror to seek our own face, the big story of God offers a life of seeking God's face. When self is submerged in Christ, true love spontaneously springs forth. I, a new identity. And what of love on this day. Noticing the dominance of the rain theme in the art and music of the Hopi people, an anthropologist asked a Hopi tribal leader why so many of his people's songs dealt with rain. The Hopi replied that it was because water is so scarce in the land where they live. He then turned to the anthropologist and asked, is that why so many of your songs are about love? We live in a world that is awash in love songs and love stories, but where love that looks beyond the eye is as rare as a clock in a casino. How are we to love and be loved? This is the hardest question being asked today. The verb form of love is often missing in action. We stop with the first person pronoun, I, and dismiss that crucial, crucial verb, love. Love has almost become the spiritual equivalent of acid rain. Do you know about this stuff? The same modes of thought and action that create raindrops that literally devour cathedrals, eat away at that stone, have likewise devoured our ability to love in the right meaning of the word, living for and lifting up what God glorifies. In the relationally polluted climate in which we live, love has taken a B-movie quality to it. We've made love into a, a low standard. When we say making love, we're typically talking about a one night stand or sex to excess. We fall in and out of love like one falls in and out of bed. A Jewish folktale demonstrates the confusion associated with the simple statement, I love you. It illustrates how difficult it can be to get the word love right. Here's the story. Once upon a time, an angler or fisherman pulls a large pike out of the water. Look at the size of this fish. I'm going to take it to the baron. He loves pike. Hearing these words, the poor fish says to himself, there's hope for me yet. When the fisherman presents himself at the gate of the manor house, the guard inquires, what do you have? I have a pike for the baron. Great, replies the guard. The baron loves pike. Once again, the fish hears the words, and while he can hardly breathe as he is brought into the palace, he still finds hope because the baron loves pike. As he is brought into the kitchen, all the cooks get excited as they look at the fish, nodding to one another how much the baron loves pike. The fish is then placed on a table, and the baron himself enters and examines the fish. Cut his tail off, cut his head off, fillet him right here. With his last breath, the fish cries out in great despair. Why did you lie to me? You don't love Pike. You love yourself. The poor fish is as confused as we are by the different meanings of the same verb. The most complex four-letter word in the language? The most significant four-letter word in human history? Love. Because it is so used, so misused and abused, love may well be the most unloved word in our language. 
And yet we are commanded to love God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. Fortunately, God not only gives us an identity for life, He provides an integrity to living a life of love. Love is God living in us, the energy of God working in us. Ephesians calls this kind of love as being an imitator of God. For the person of faith, integrity and love is important because without it we can damage our witness. If someone knows that you have no integrity, you're not going to get too far with that presentation of the gospel. They're not likely to listen to your testimony. In many ways, our level of integrity demonstrates our spiritual condition. 1 Corinthians 13, most of you are very familiar with it, is commonly known as the love chapter. This chapter is meaningless prose if it's not approached with and lived out with integrity. I'm going to read that chapter to you, and I want you to close your eyes and imagine how hard it would be to love like the love that's described here without integrity. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardships that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain Nothing. Now here comes the definition of love with integrity. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. I wish it would have left that one out. <laughs> love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the ways of childhood. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The true character of love is self-giving the emptying and expending of oneself for the well-being of others. True love lays down the drawbridge of the eye so that others can cross over into the presence of God. No one has greater love than this, Jesus said, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You don't find love by looking for it. You find love by laying it down and letting it go. The lifestyle of love, the life that is lived in the presence of God, is not based on I love, therefore I am, but I am love, therefore I am. Or in more biblically resonant words, we love because He first loved us. Our ability to get love right is in itself a gift, one that does not come from within, but from a God who loves us in spite of ourselves. This gift from God makes us lovely and able to love like God loves. Some of you may remember that movie, that story, Beauty and the Beast. It's only when the beast discovers that beauty really loves him in all his ugliness that he himself becomes beautiful. I struggled with this message quite a bit this week, and I recall that the last time I spoke about love, it was a dud. <laughs> and, and I had kind of a a word I used back in January, I had a little bit of an epiphany. And I realized that I'm writing and speaking these words, but every theological word falls short in attempting to measure the length and the depth and the breadth of God's love. 
every religious word fails. His love is wide as the sky, but as small as the cracks in your heart that nobody knows about. When all other words are said and done, the text says only love will remain. It's the word we say too easily, but not often enough. To love as God loves, to offer forgiveness, to extend grace, to foster hope, to sacrificially give, none of this is possible without God's power and our acceptance of it by faith. You can believe. Belief is saying, I believe in a loving God. Faith is saying, Jesus loved me. This I know. Belief says God is love. Faith says God loves me. And because he loves me, I cannot love you. Until it becomes personal, love is no more tangible than a nice idea. No more intriguing than a fancy theory. God is the supreme source of love is a pleasant thought. But it is nothing more than that and until a belief changes to faith through direct experience. To those who have been given a new identity and who have access to a love of integrity, Christ issues a command. Love others as Christ has loved us. But how can you command love? You can't command an emotion or an attitude, but you can command an action. God doesn't command us to be loving or to feel loving, but simply to love, period. Black and white, no shades of gray. There is no law in the books of civil society that commands love. You can't do it. There is no principle of philosophy that makes love a command. Only God does. A new identity of I, a new integrity of love, leads us to you. We begin the treatment of you with these verses from 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. And here's the you part. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. One of the greatest spiritual histories of our time and particularly here in the United States is that we can function in this world by ourselves, that I can live without you, that I can cry in perfect privacy, that I can worship alone. But even Jesus said, I and my Father are one. In Christ, where identity has integrity, 
the I becomes you. Our inward focus turns outward. Intimacy is a scary word. We put so much into that with our romantic love. But God desires an intimate relationship with us that transcends anything we can imagine. Integrity means that we love others with integrity amid loss. And our losses are huge. Abandonment, betrayal, death, failure, guilt, heartache, jealousy, poverty, rage, sorrow, on and on and on. Intimacy is about sharing ourself with those we trust. Lovers will cry, Jesus did, over his best friend Lazarus. Lovers will be lonely and afraid, Jesus was in the garden. Lovers will get furiously angry, Jesus did in the temple. Lovers will be rejected and betrayed, Jesus was betrayed by Judas, by Peter, and if we think really hard about it, all of the disciples. And lovers will be at times misunderstood. Jesus was almost constantly misunderstood. The needle of our inner compass needs to point in the direction of true north towards Jesus. But if you've ever held a compass and ever looked at that, what does it do when it points towards north? It trembles. It trembles because intimacy is risky. Love can be painful. Everyone with a new identity, integrity, and intimacy functions from a broken heart. The testimony of the scriptures is this. If you love, it's going to break your heart. The only question is, what kind of love will break your heart? Bob Pierce, the founder of World Vision, wrote these words on the flyleaf of his Bible. Let my heart be broken with the things that break the heart of God. The cross is the ultimate symbol of a broken heart. For there on the cross, God's heart broke. Today, this Valentine's Day, if you want to give your wife, your husband, your children, your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your neighbors, your co-workers, your enemies, if you want to give them the best gift on this day, would you turn to your Creator and accept His invitation to be mine? Luke, you might want to throw in some candy and flowers, but for the rest of us, would you respond to that invitation? He can provide you with the integrity your love needs to impact the hard hearts of this world. And he can show you what true intimacy is all about. I wasn't the best English student. I did okay. You know, C's get degrees. I think I, I got B's in English, actually. But the ultimate problem we have with these three words is a problem with grammar. I is the subject, love is the verb, and you is the object. Whenever we treat you as objects and not as subjects, we compromise the gospel. Whenever we see things as apart from ourselves and not as part of ourselves, we compromise the gospel that knows no objects, only subjects. It would be better if we would live according to I, you love, rather than I love you. With I, you love, we accept the responsibility God has given us by loving us first. Because I am loved by God, and only because of God's love, I can love others. And not just those usual suspects, not just the family and friends, but even our enemies. In the words of Scripture, we love because He first loved us. We cannot ignore the power of this truth. We'll never say the words perfectly ourselves. But we can praise God that we have not been left on our own to figure it out. We have not been left on our own to figure out how to get the three hardest words in the world right. God took the initiative by choosing to love us first, and God is our mentor and teacher, helping us with the daunting challenge of practicing the three hardest words. Our tribe, Seventh-day Adventists, believe that the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world, will be a revelation of its character of love. A God who so loved the world, a Christ who so redeemed the world, a spirit that so pervades the world, that you have been granted a new identity, equipped with a new integrity, and empowered by a new intimacy. My 
major rang. It was the pediatric intensive care unit. An abandoned baby, a ward of the state that I had been following had taken a turn for the worse, and the nurses called me to pray over the child. I did so deeply. And then I returned to the chaplain's office and I shared with my coworkers the sad story, the lonely ordeal that this small baby was going through. As I relayed the story, one of my colleagues, her name was Linda, she jumped to her feet and force, forcefully said, no, this baby will not die alone. I wasn't a father yet at that time, but Linda was a grandmother. She went to that unit, and as an intimate stranger, she held that baby well into the night. Past quitting time, past dinner time, past the start of Dancing with the Stars, past her bedtime, until that sweet, innocent child, who had never known love, died in his arms. Or maybe it was the arms of Christ. It's hard to be sure now. Christians are many things. Christians are people who love beauty and truth and goodness. They're people who welcome strangers, confront danger with a light heart, and who in the face of death choose life. They are people who, in the face of violence and hatred, choose hope. And they are so much more. But above and beyond everything else, Christians are people like Linda, whose very presence speaks the three words of the eternal presence.